Greetings, fellow math people. Today we have a very fascinating integral, as always anyway. We have the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x squared times log x divided by x squared dx. And we're going to solve it using some pretty fancy techniques, so it's going to be fun. What exactly is our approach here? Well, I'd like to begin by defining an integral function i of some parameter alpha as the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the alpha times sine x squared dx. And there are a couple of reasons for that. First up, if I plug in alpha equal to negative 2, then I recover this x squared in the denominator of the integrand. Also, we need a log x term, and we can get that by differentiating partially with respect to alpha, x to the alpha, because that would lead to x to the alpha times log x. Okay, cool. Now, there is the question of whether or not we can differentiate under the integral sign, and that depends on the convergence of the integral function, which is a pretty trivial thing to show, but because this is a question often coming up in the comments section, I might as well give you one way to decipher whether or not the integral function does converge for a given choice of the alpha parameter. By choice, of course, I mean domain of the alpha parameter. So, for x belonging to the open interval from 0 to 1, we see that the integrand is a bounded function, so yeah, no problems with convergence over there. But what about the integral from 1 to infinity? Well, we'll analyze the absolute value of the integral from 1 to infinity of x to the alpha times sine x squared dx. This thing is less than or equal to the integral from 1 to infinity of x to the alpha times sine x squared all in the absolute value. And this thing is, of course, less than or equal to the integral from 1 to infinity. x to the alpha here is a positive real number and sine x squared oscillates between 0 and 1. So this thing is less than the integral of x to the alpha dx. And this thing does indeed converge for alpha being less than negative 1. So that's a sort of dominated convergence type analysis for our integral function. And now we can proceed with our plan. We'll differentiate with respect to alpha and get i prime of alpha on the left. And on the right, we have the derivative with respect to alpha of the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the alpha times sine x squared dx. We know that we can switch up the order of the operators now. So we have the integral from 0 to infinity of the partial derivative with respect to alpha due to the Leibniz rule of x to the alpha times sine x squared dx. And that yields the integral from 0 to infinity. Sine x squared is going to be held a constant for differentiation anyway. So we have x to the alpha times sine x squared times log x dx. So the target integral i is indeed the derivative of our integral function evaluated at alpha equal to negative 2. So now the plan is to come up with some closed form for our integral function and then differentiate it with respect to alpha and then finally plug in the required value. To evaluate this integral, the first thing I'd like to do is transform it slightly by letting x squared equal u, which implies that x here equals root u, which further implies that dx equals 1 half times u to the negative 1 half du. And the limits of integration are clearly not altered. So we have i of alpha equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of u to the alpha by 2 times u to the negative 1 half times sine u du times 1 half. And this can be written as 1 half times the integral from 0 to infinity of u to the alpha minus 1 over 2 times sine u du. Now, one way to evaluate this thing is to just look up a table of Mellin transforms for the sine function. However, the cool way, that is to say the Chad way of solving this, would be to apply Ramanujan's master theorem, which is exactly what we're going to do. So first, let's invoke complex numbers, because why not? We know that sine u here is the imaginary part of e to the i times u. So that means we can restate the integral as i of alpha equal to 1 half the imaginary part of the integral from 0 to infinity of u to the, I'm writing the exponent as alpha plus 1 over 2 minus 1 times e to the i times u du. And now for the star of our show, Ramanujan's Master Theorem. 
link in the description box for a proof of this master theorem, which is pretty much the same proof that Ramanujan himself provided, although a superior proof is by G. H. Hardy, which I really should make a video on one of these days. Anyway, so the theorem states that if we have the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the s minus 1 times a function f of x, such that the function has a really cool series expansion that's sort of a Maclaurin series expansion of this form. We have the sum over k from 0 to infinity of negative x to the k times phi of k, where phi is some analytic function, divided by k factorial. In this case, the integral that is the Mellin transform of f of x equals gamma s times phi at negative s. So our objective here would be to expand this function in terms of a series that looks like this and uncover what phi is in this context. And I'm just going to replace the dummy variable back to x because, again, it's a dummy variable. It doesn't matter what we name it as. And notice that we have negative x to the k as part of the series expansion. And that would be really easy to generate if we had e to the negative x instead, which is no problem whatsoever. Up top, we could introduce a couple of extra negative signs. And the reason for that is that negative sine theta is the imaginary part of e to the negative i theta. So that means we have negative one half times the imaginary part of the integral with e to the negative i x. And that's pretty useful because e to the z can be expanded as the sum over k from 0 to infinity of z to the k divided by k factorial. So e to the negative i x equals the sum over k from 0 to infinity of negative x to the k times i to the k divided by k factorial. So we immediately decipher that phi of s equals i to the s, which is a complex power function, and can be expanded as e to the s times log i, where the logarithm here is the principal logarithm to ensure that this thing is holomorphic. And we're evaluating phi at the non-negative integers, so there isn't much of a problem to begin with, to be honest. Anyway, so what exactly is log i? Well, log i equals the logarithm of the absolute value of i plus i times the principal argument, which in this case, of course, is pi over 2. The absolute value of i is 1, so this thing is just 0, and we have log i equal to i pi over 2. So that means phi of s equals, terribly sorry about that, i to the s, which is e to the i pi over 2 times s. Okay, cool. So this implies that the target integral i of alpha equals negative 1 half times the imaginary part of gamma at s. s in this case is, of course, alpha plus 1 over 2. So that means we have gamma alpha plus 1 over 2 times e to the negative s so that is negative i pi over 2 times, wait, we could write this as pi over 4 times alpha plus 1. And now would be a good time to separate this into real and imaginary parts. We know, of course, that the imaginary part of e to the negative i pi over 4 times alpha plus 1 equals sine of negative pi over 4 times alpha plus 1. And the sine function is an odd function anyway, so we get this extra negative sign that cancels out with the one we already have. So we have i of alpha equal to 1 half times gamma alpha plus 1 over 2 times sine of pi over 4 times alpha plus 1. And all we need to do now is differentiate this thing with respect to alpha so that we have i prime of alpha equal to a quarter of gamma prime at alpha plus 1 over 2 times sine of pi over 4 times alpha plus 1 plus pi over 8, yes indeed, of gamma times gamma plus 1 over gamma of alpha plus 1 over 2. It's a lot easier to write. Anyway, so we have cosine of pi over 4 times alpha plus 1 over 2. And the target case is alpha equal to negative 2 because that yields the target integral i. So this thing equals a quarter of gamma prime, terribly sorry about that, gamma prime at negative 1 half 
times sine of negative pi over 4 plus pi over 8 times gamma negative 1 half times the cosine of negative pi over 4. Now what exactly is the derivative of the gamma function at negative 1 half? Well, look no further than your coffee mug, which has the important derivatives of the gamma function written all over it, including gamma double prime at 1, which is absolutely beautiful. And if the vessel in which you house your coffee or tea or water does not contain these important derivatives of the gamma function, don't worry, we got you covered. You can click on the link in the description box to get one of these for yourself. So that way, whenever you're solving a gnarly integral and suddenly you need to refer to the derivatives of the gamma function, you have them written in front of you on your coffee mug as you sip your coffee and enjoy the math process or things you're doing. Of course, there is the question of what if I'm not having coffee at that, at that time or I just don't want to have coffee then or tea or even drink water. I want to be completely dehydrated when I'm doing my math. First up, I do not recommend that. And number two, if you're not having coffee, well, you could just refer to your shirt that also has the derivatives of the gamma function written on it. Isn't that convenient? Regardless of wherever you're noting down these values, including the notebook on which you're solving this integral along with me, we read off that gamma prime at negative one half equals two times root pi times the Euler Mascheroni constant minus two plus two times log two. And we also know that gamma negative one half is negative two times root pi. And all you need is some algebra. And then you have this absolutely gorgeous closed form for our target integral. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.